like to call the uh, May 18th school committee meeting to order and, and welcome, especially to all the students. Great to see everybody here. Uh, well, tonight we'll, we'll start with public input, and after that we going to have a presentation from the students on the uh, robotics team and following that we'll have a uh, district governance discussion with uh, Ms. Dorothy Presser who's in the back over there and uh, the and then report on the audit from Siebert. Uh, so is there any public input tonight? Seeing none? Okay. I don't know who's going to do it. Welcome Who to the like robotics to team. Start. Caitlin? And I understand part of this will adjourn upstairs. Okay. Yeah, up on Main Street. Sorry. That's what we do. Okay. So I'm not, I'm not going way over there. Yeah, they don't. Um, so I just wanted to start off by saying thank you to all of you. I'm Caitlin. For those of you, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a senior at the high school, so this was my last year on the robotics team. I really appreciate all the support. I know myself and Shirag, who's upstairs, the other co-president, really appreciate all you, that you've done. Now I'd like to pass it off to our presentation team, who are all our underclassmen. So here's our presentation. Great. Great, thank, thank you. you. All right, um, I'm Polly. I'm going to be a senior next year, and it's going to be my fourth year on the team. I'm Andrew. I'm going to be a senior next year, and it's going to be my third year on the team. I'm Jake. I'm uh, going to be a sophomore next year, and this is my first year on the team. Hi, I'm James. I'm going to be a junior next year, and this is my second year on the team. Great. All right, so we are team 4761. Um, this is a brief synopsis of our mission. Um, some main points is that we love to promote STEM initiative and we like to foster connections with organizations within and outside of FIRST. Um, so uh, we're part of FIRST, um, the organization. It's a worldwide, very big organization for science and technology. We're part of FRC, which is the oldest section of FIRST and um, it allows us to get a good engineering and business experience before we graduate high school. Um, so our team, the Robockets, we've been growing steadily since we were created in 2013. We have 47 students and 15 mentors, all of which are professionals in their fields. They help us out with building the robot, designing a robot, the business side of it. Everything that we do is helped out by mentors. and. Um, Two of those 47 students over there, um, Jack and Thomas, they're junior members. They're eighth graders from Parker Middle School. And um, so this is part of a program we have where we bring eighth graders in to get an experience with FIRST before they become part of the high school. <coughs> so we're aiming to not only expand our amount of students and mentors, but we also want to get some more <coughs> junior members, especially from Coolidge next year. So this list is um, a list of the things that the 47 students do on the team. Um, each of these bullet points is a sub-team of our main team, and they govern everything that's part of the robot and everything outside of it. Um, something I'd like to highlight is our award-winning business team, and um, it's a great example that um, in FIRST, you can be a good participating <coughs> person in the organization and not even touch the robot at all. So they run the organization, they run the, the finance of everything, and it's just like operating a small business, except it's a school organization. So besides our team structure, which was new this year, one of the biggest changes that our team um, went through was moving into our new shop downstairs. And I'd like to thank Dr. Doherty especially for helping us get this new area. Um, and with this new shop space, we were able to get a CNC machine um, from Northeastern University, which was donated to us as value of about $35,000. Um, and we were able to make really cool um, metal machine parts, like this one, this is our team logo. Pass around if you want. Be careful. Careful of <laughs> 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 it. won't hurt Pass it around. Show it. That's what's that point. Yeah. <laughs> I see it. <laughs> it's beautiful. Um, so one of the biggest things that our team tried to focus on this year was increasing our team entrepreneurship. 
Um, so one of the biggest things that we did for this was writing a team business plan, which covered basically our fundraising and outreach programs. Um, and we also um, submitted a lot more grants this year than we had in the past to get more funding for the team. Um, we also hosted our first district event right here at the high school, which I think some of you attended. Um, so that was really awesome. Um, and we also tried to increase our social media focus on our um, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram accounts. Um, and did a lot of various outreach events to the community. Um, so this is a graph of our funding for the year. As you can see, we raised a lot more this year because of our new business plan and structure. Um, and we were actually able to exceed our budget of about $50,000, um, which was awesome. Um, and as you can see, we also spent a lot more this year. <laughs> Obviously, um, we spent a lot more um, getting stuff prepared to host our district event and also um, on our competition fees because we were able to qualify for the championship this year. Um, and as you might notice, there's a large gap in between the um, funding and expenses, and this is because um, even though we qualified to girl to the world championship in St. Louis this year, we actually decided to um, save our money and we're going to use that to invest in the future of the team by buying new tools and equipment. So this year's game was a game called Recycle Rush, and as some of you might know who came to the running competition, uh, you might be a bit familiar with it, and we'll explain a bit more later, but the basic concept of this year was you had to stack totes and stack um, trash cans on top of it, and you got various points depending on how you made the stacks. And so our robot this year was built to do it, and this is a picture of it right here. It's not that good, but you'll be able to see it better later. And then something else cool is this is a CAD rendering of a robot, which we did for the first time ever this year, and it really it ties together what we're learning in school in um, the PLTW classes, like in, uh, Intro to Engineering Design, and the team, because we were we wouldn't have been able to do this without uh, what some of our students have learned in Intro to Engineering Design. So, as some of you might know, we hosted a competition this year, which is very exciting, and over forty and forty teams participated, and. Over 3,000 people came. Uh, one exciting part was that Dr. Doherty and our principal, Mr. Bakker, both were judges there, and Dr. Doherty gave a very good speech. And uh, so it was a very exciting opportunity for us, and we believe that we're going to get the opportunity to do it again next year. So we had a very good season this year. Um, at the writing competition, we ranked 11th and made it to the semifinals as an alliance captain. And then at Rhode Island, we uh, were ranked 17th, and we made it to the quarterfinals. And the, uh, that uh, allowed us to qualify for the New England Championship, where we were among the top 60 out of the 175 teams in New England. And one other thing, as James mentioned earlier, is we have an award-winning business team. We actually won the Entrepreneurship Award for a business plan at both of our district events, and we were the only team in New England to have accomplished that. Okay, what comes next? So we're fo hoping to focus on the outreach to elementary and middle schools, especially on engaging girls. And we are also hoping to integrate FIRST Robotics into the RMHS curriculum. Also, community involvement. So we have junior members, as uh, we just talked about. And uh, we also are hoping to host the Science Expo, which I'm going to talk about a lot more in the next slide. Uh, okay, so for the Science Expo, our vision is to create a district-wide Science Expo for middle, middle and elementary school students. Hopefully this will increase uh, STEM interest and for the location, we are hoping to get your help with the location. And off-season events, so you can find us at uh, the Reading Friends and Family Fair, uh, Family Day and the Reading Street Fair. Mm -hmm. So does anyone have any questions? Yes. So um, with 47 members of the team and some junior members, um, I see there's a lot of different functions on the team. So, but how does it really, does it really enable everyone to be involved and engaged? Well, everyone's involved to varying amounts. Like some kids, like I know I was, was there, were pr there pretty much every day of the season, but a lot of kids aren't there. They have other commitments. So they're there maybe two or three days a week. So there's varying amounts and we're also, where we're really focusing on expanding is the business side and the outreach side, which enables a lot more kids to participate. And we also are very flexible um, within the system. So if you want to work on the business team and also work on the robot, that's fine. You don't have to just sign up for one aspect of the team. 
can I yes. can I ask you to just go back to the slide that had sort of the ongoing current nope back another one I want that one right I just wanted to um, I just wanted to take that in a little bit more that's all <laughs> <laughs> and ask about the Merrimack College outreach. So that's something that you've been doing and are going to continue to do, is or well, um, a team from Merrimack College who is competing in the NASA Robotics Challenge, which is a thing for colleges where they work on um, creating essentially uh, simulations of moon rovers. Um, contacted us because part of their challenge was to provide outreach about, uh, around the challenge. So a couple weeks ago we. They met with us, they demoed their robot and explained a bit about their team, and then we did the same thing with our team and our robot. And I think we're looking to continue that relationship. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Stark. I'm, I'm continually struck by how articulate, articulate you are about your goals um, and your plans, how forward thinking you are about your plans. And also, we've talked a lot about grit and I know that you started off with very little, and I'm so impressed with what you've built because I know that you didn't even have a place to practice. You were sort of roaming with this huge robot, <laughs> um, and, and you sold it, and you got 3,000 people to come to your event, and together with the parents and the mentors, you organized judges and um, mentors and all these teams and we just heard such accolades of all of you um, so I just thank you for what you've done for the town and this is an awesome club thank you. and I'd like to plug steam as opposed to stem <laughs> 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 include the arts <laughs> yes yes oh okay I'm just can you tell us more about the mentors um, so the mentors, um, they're usually like friends or parents of people on the team. And um, every one of our mentors is a professional um, in whatever field they are. In like Mr. Bacon right here, um, he's a professional engineer and he's one of the most um, active mentors around. And so they just help us out with building the robot, designing the robot, providing feedback and criticism to our ideas, and teaching us. Um, next year we're looking to become more autonomous so we're gonna have the mentors focus a lot more on teaching us you know how to do things on our own so that when it comes down to building the robot it's not them you know guiding us it's us you know figuring out what we have to do and figuring everything out ourselves how many days a week do you guys <clears throat> together um, so on the off season um, which would be like October through January we meet every Tuesday night um, but once build season kicks in, which is around the middle of January, or the beginning, yeah. we meet six days a week. Yeah, from the beginning of January till this year, it was right before April vacation, which was our build season and competition season. We were meeting or competing seven days a week. Yeah. Um, and in terms of time commitment, it, it's Saturdays, it's all day, and the uh, weekdays, it's like four hours a day. So it's a big time commitment if you're really involved with the team and want to make a big impact. Ms. Karowski. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Caitlin. I mm -hmm. remember you presenting last year, so you're a senior. Yes. Um, I'd like to hear what you're going to be doing next year, and uh, maybe a little <coughs> bit about having, um, sort of being at the end of this journey on the robotics team, um, how you feel it's prepared you for college. Okay, so, yeah. Come yes, to the mic. Come to the, the microphone. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, I, oh, I can talk louder. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. So, I originally joined the robotics team because I knew, or I really wanted to program a robot. I wanted to learn more about computer science and do all of that. When joining the team, there were tons of programmers already, so I looked at some of the stuff, but they all knew a lot more than me because I was taking AP computer science this year, so I really didn't know anything when I joined last year. So I worked a lot on the mechanical side of the robot and electrical. And then this year, I was made the business co-president, so I helped out a lot with the writing grants the business side of things. So how that brought me to college is next year I'll be attending Bucknell University and I got into a five year program between the college or the College of Engineering and the School of Management for computer science, engineering and engineering management. Well, congratulations. Thanks. That is great. <laughs> That's great. That's yeah. 
Yes, Ms. Swift. Um, one more question, maybe it's just uh, if we can follow up um, at other times, Dr. Darty. I'm just really interested in how we can incorporate some of this into the curriculum. Um, I know uh, work with a district, a middle school district that truly does have STEM integrated in the curriculum. And, uh, you know, we'd like to see that as an opportunity, um, especially for, you know, students that can't invest that as much time as, you know, you, you, know, you, you all do and, and most of the team does, but would have the opportunity during the normal school day. Well, one thing that we're eventually looking to do, and this is more of a long-term goal, is have a first robotics class in the school. <coughs> and um, at, we talked about this a bit last year, but that's something that a couple teams have done. And so we'd be able, for some kids, they'd be able to work on the robot during the school day and also learn other aspects of engineering and even business through the off-season during school. I, I think maybe some opportunities to look at some aspects of the work that you do that could be maybe even incorporated into some existing classes. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the focus on the CAD and the experience you get with CAD and um, really the hands-on is so critical because you can design, you know, a bridge and you can look at it on paper or you can design something and talk about tension and compression or different forces. But until you try it and you don't connect something quite right, to know that if you don't connect it right, it's going to fail. Um, it, you know, you don't, you just, you're learning so much more because you've got your hands on something. And that's, you know, this school used to have full shops and CNC machines. And um, so it's great to see one back here. And uh, I think we just need to keep looking for those opportunities to get students' hands on real world things, not just uh, the virtual. <coughs> Something to add on to that is um, the science expo that we were planning on doing. Yeah, and that's going in the direction that you're um, aiming at. Like, <laughs> we're going to have you know, a variety of events from different fields of science to get students' hands on things. And so you know, they can build that bridge that they were talking about. And you know, they can take what they learned in their classes and apply it to the real world. And it might only be a day or two, but they can get a feel for what it's like to do all that and help them inspire them and, you know, pursue their careers or whatever. So that sounds like a great collaboration with the science, the science Olympiad team and the team at Parker and, um, mm -hmm. you know, your Lego, David, the first Lego leagues, you know, teams to um, make a really amazing day. And it sounds suspiciously close to a goal that was stated many years ago about being a STEM, you know, it's a team STEM center of excellence. Um, so it's very exciting. Thank you. Go ahead. Can you go back to that slide that had, <coughs> that had the fundraising and the... Uh. <laughs> <laughs> we should hire them. <laughs> so I, maybe you said it. Can you share with, like, the corporate sponsors who they are or... Yes. So our biggest corporate sponsors is um, United Technologies Corporation. So they actually, <coughs> instead of pledging us a certain amount, just pledged to cover all of our entry fees for the year. Um, and so um, when we qualified for championships, they covered that and they covered the entry fees for two of our district events. Um, and some of our other major sponsors, which are mostly engineering companies, we have um, Teradyne and Textron and Raytheon and couple others, um, which I can't. Uh, your mother's oh, yeah. company? That's <laughs> <laughs> My wonderful mother works at and yeah. Pfizer. <laughs> <laughs> Applied materials. So, and the, so who's pitching the, the, the corporate people, the students? Yeah, so actually we do, um, we do presentations similar to this where we'll go to a company and um, basically talk about our mission on the team and um, what we're looking for from them. Um, and we're also not just looking for money from them. Usually um, we look for some mentors from the, um, their companies. So for example, we have two mentors from, who are from Textron and Teradyne. Um, and we're also looking for possible donations of old parts and stuff that they're not using. And one of the most valuable things that we received from our sponsors this year was um, Teradyne uh, gave us almost unlimited use of the 3D printer, which was very valuable since a lot of our robot was 3D printed this year. So we were able to, well, with a uh, home 3D printer might take us days to print stuff. We were able to CAD something and have 20 of it ready for us the next night. Did you have a quick I did have a question. There was a little caveat put in there about especially um, looking for 
more involvement from students, especially from Coolidge. Do you find that students gravitate from one middle school or the other? Um, does it relate to anything that you can? So, um, the only reason that we only have two junior members from Parker is actually because they're family members of other team members. Um, so we had not previously before this year contacted Parker Coolidge to do that. So our goal for next year is to go to them before the season starts and say, ask if there are any kids interested in coming to join the team instead of just taking on um, younger siblings. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, um, how many seniors I didn't how are involved? I, think we have I believe three. Three. Uh, yeah. three active, but five overall this year. And what are their, do you, do you know, Caitlin, what their plans are? Are they going into? I believe everyone's going into engineering. I know Shirag, the other co-president, is doing aerospace at RPI. Um, Steven is going to Embry-Riddle for mechanical. Ryan Craven's going to UVM for some type of engineering. And Liam's going for engineering at UPIT. So I believe that's yeah. And one of those people actually won a, it's a four-year scholarship, oh, yeah. a, a first scholarship. Nice. So first robotic sponsor, sometimes they get, they give a full ride, sometimes they give certain dollar amounts. So first, they, the they organization yeah. first. first. Yeah. Yeah. The, the colleges give it, but they give it solely to right. first participants. Oh, okay. Right. Right. Oh. So one of those people did get a first nice. scholarship. So, Dr. Doherty put you on the spot, so I guess <laughs> <laughs> just looking at this and thinking down the road, uh, maybe we, when we start talking about down next year and whether we look at this as maybe a, a like an athletics uh, and have a budget for it and uh, yeah, we're in. I, I think it's a greater discussion than just robotics. Yeah. I, we have a lot of academic teams at the high school. Mm -hmm. and at our middle schools and I think it's it's a discussion that we should in, have inclusive of all of our academic teams not just no offense but no, I, mean, yeah. I mean we have science teams we have math teams um, you know I think we need to look at all of it and you know how can we support them a little bit more Good. so we're gonna move upstairs we, we won't adjourn I guess we'll stay in yeah. session Unless there were other questions, I'm sorry. Questions? You can ask us up there too. And if you want to walk out past the shop that is, and then go up the stairs, you can take a peek into our new space, which is very exciting. It's, a little, it's still we're rearranging it right now, but it's you pretty can, clean. It's but yeah, it's more organized. <laughs> <It's laughs> <hard to manage. laughs> if it's anyone's well, interested here, some of our contact stuff. information, you can follow us on Facebook, That's right. we have Twitter, Instagram, and we have a website. <laughs>
And when we talk about student achievement, we're not just talking about your test scores. Um, we're talking about student achievement as you define it for your students. So when you think about, you know, what do we want to accomplish um, in our district for our children as they walk across the stage at graduation? Um, what, what can we do as school committee members or as a governance team with our superintendent to continuously improve what we're doing for our students? Um, so far, we've worked with about 50 different districts across the state, all types of districts, um, vocational, regional, urban, suburban, um, all types. And along with bringing you the practices, these research-based practices, I find that one of the other benefits of the program is sort of a cross-pollination of an ideas that we can bring from one committee to another. You know, as one committee is kind of struggling with something, you know, I can say, well, you know, I've worked with another committee who has found solution X. And sometimes it resonates, and sometimes they say, that'll never work here. But, um, it is a way to sort of bring some, some of those ideas um, that work for districts across the state. Um, it's a very flexible program. We work really hard to tailor it to every district that we work with or every committee that we work with. So we're not giving you a bunch of canned presentations or workshops. Um, particularly in the area around goal setting and um, we really work to find out where you are in your your strategic plan your district improvement plan whatever you call it so that we're not coming in and retreading places you've already trod um, or being ahead of where you may be um, in terms of the work that you're doing um, so the easiest part of talking about the district governance program is that it's a member service and there's no charge for you to participate. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> <Awesome. laughs> um, <laughs> that's like the easiest sell job I get. Um, and at, again, as I said, as the heart of the program, it's to introduce you to ways when you can work smarter, not harder, um, in, in pursuit of the goals that you want for your district. Tell you a little bit basically about how the program works. Um, there are five workshops if you choose to participate in all of them. Sometimes we find that people, that dis committees are so far in their goal setting, we can kind of turn that into four. Um, but they're about two hours each. Um, we have developed sort of a, um, uh, this idea of you're building your governance schoolhouse um, as a way to sort of remember the, what you're working on, we figure everyone's probably pretty attuned to the idea of a school building project. Um, so the idea of building your schoolhouse resonates with people. So we start with the foundation, which is operating protocols or norms or whatever you call them in your district, um, which is basically talking about how, how does the school committee, the superintendent, that governance team work together and communicate smoothly. Just so think about thinking about how you work together and getting that sort of out of the way so you can concentrate on what work needs to be done. And in that, concentrating not only on are there, are there issues you need to talk about, but also thinking about, well, what do we do well that we want to make sure we articulate and continue to do as a group as we work together. Um, from there, we move on to overarching goals, which is thinking about the vision, the aspirational um, goals that you have in place for your students in your district. Make sure that everybody's on the same page, has the same vision, and is moving forward in sort of in lockstep. Then taking that down to a more specific um, SMART goals. What do, what do we do in the near term with um, key actions and benchmarks that helps us move forward and, and get closer and closer to our goals? How do we monitor progress towards getting to those goals? Um, what's the school committee's role in furthering things, you know, in furthering those goals without stepping in the sandbox of the administration and vice versa? Um, and then um, we have some tools that we talk about in each of those, in each of the workshops and operating protocols. It might be, you know, articulating, putting in writing your protocols um, and overarching goals, obviously having that document in place. Um, when we talk about monitoring progress, we talk about having SMART goals, creating perhaps a year-long agenda that helps you consistently monitor the progress and keep track of your goals, even as other things are happening in the district, which may um, require your attention <coughs> for a certain amount of time. Um, we, talk, we spend one workshop talking about effective meetings, which is kind of where some of the work smarter, not harder, can come into place, um, making sure that you're 
effectively using your meeting time in turn to monitor goals to further your progress and to um, concentrate on the work that needs to be done. Um, one of my, one of the exercises that we do that tends to be interesting to people is sort of an, an agenda audit, looking back on a year's worth of agenda and thinking about where you spent your time and is that the place where you thought you were spending your time or where you want to be spending your time. Um, and then talking a little bit about um, presentation formats. Um, is there a way that you can be more effective in what you ask for in your presentations that gets you the information that you want? And then um, we sort of put the roof over everything uh, by talking about sustaining progress and tools that you can use to sustain the practices that you've built over time over changes that may occur on the committee or in the administration so that your team can keep chugging along smoothly as, as it goes along. Um, so that's an overview and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. So would you, so how, do, how does something like that get started? Would you just come out and observe and uh, like for is it this, how we run our meetings? Would you sit through meetings and come back with feedback? How does that? No, actually you would tell me how you, okay. that we, we would work in a workshop on that. Okay. Um, and you know, we start out with having you sort of go through thinking about um, actually in the first workshop, what happens, how do we work uh, before meetings, during meetings, and between meetings, and sort of um, think, get you thinking about that, um, and then thinking about what do we want to concentrate on in terms of perhaps changing or um, doing better. Um, and then the agenda audit is another way where you're thinking about how do you do the meetings. One of the, one of the um, big benefits of this program compared to other types of training that we do is they're working with your committee all at once, all of you together. Um, so it's not people going off and coming back with information to the committee, um, but it's all of you sitting down and working together to figure out together um, what will work best for you. Um, when we talk about operating protocols, um, we talk about you developing, every committee needs their own unique set of operating protocols. We can't walk in and say, here, follow these, it'll be great. Um, we really need you to think about how do we as a team work together. Um, so it really is very tailored to your, you know, to your committee. Okay. Yes. So then in preparation for that, we would be probably providing you with some of the um, information that we have around our district goals and mm -hmm. you would be reviewing all of that mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. um, before mm -hmm. sort of that first workshop. Right. right, and then as you know, as we go through the different workshops, then I would be asking questions ahead of time. So I can tailor it to what you need as opposed to coming in and. How do committees usually set it up as a additional meeting um, uh, per, over the five, five weeks or more than five weeks, more I than would five say. Weeks. Yeah. We usually um, suggest that there be about a month or six weeks between workshops. Oh, okay. Um, because there is a work product Okay. that we ask you to think about or work on between each meeting so that gives you time to do it and you know sort of reflect a bit. Um, we do it pretty much however works for the committee. Okay. I've done it sometimes ahead of a meeting, you know, for some time ahead of the start of a meeting on an all, you know, if you, like on a Monday night that you don't have a meeting perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we do them on Saturdays. Sometimes we combine them. Um, so that we're doing a <coughs> Saturday workshop. Um, it's really, we, we're working at your behest, you know, so it's whatever works for you, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll make it work. So, oh, I'm sorry, a lot of our, I'm thinking in terms of like the agenda audit, there are things on our agenda that appear there for every meeting, but a lot of it, see, a lot of it is, I don't want to use the, word reactionary, but a lot of it will be a topic that we need to address immediately mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it's something that's happening in the district. Uh, so it wouldn't be, we wouldn't be, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have been planned well in advance. It might be that week or something. Mm -hmm. So, Well, and when we talk about a year-long agenda, is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Um, I always call that the most flexible document in the district. <laughs> Um, but it does allow you to do some, some planning about when do we want to hear about MCAS results, when do we want to uh, approve the student handbook, you know, things that are tasks that you mm -hmm. need to do. 
And then also if you have those <coughs> annual goals and you have the actions and benchmarks that you want to monitor the progress on, you can plug in those presentations and make sure that they don't fall by the wayside, that you're continuing to monitor um, those goals and have those presentations. Um, and sometimes it just helps you balance out the length of your meetings um, to know that you're not getting four or five major presentations bulked up in one meeting and then the next meeting's really short because <laughs> there's no presentation. And it helps the staff plan um, to know when they are expected to be presenting. Yes. Um, do you prefer a committee to commit to a certain number of workshops at the outset or is it something where you can say, well, we'd like to try one, um, work on the work product, have a, a five to six week lead time and then move forward sort of um, slowly as opposed to commit all up front? We do both. We do both. So um, I have to say most committees probably co um, decide on the date of the next workshop at the workshop we're at. Um, but it is nice to know sometimes that they are planned out. It kind of depends on if, if, if the committee feels able to plan out or if the committee feels that. Um, and, you know, we find times there's, like especially around this time of the year, there might be a bit of a hiatus as, you know, the budget uh, work gets, <laughs> gets kind of hot and heavy <laughs> until that happens. So it's really, again, up to the committee what works best for the committee. Thank you. Yeah, I guess I'd be more mindful of uh, staff and, you know, the superintendent having to prepare. We try to do a, put everything in at once, you know, so. Uh, is any other questions? So, Dorothy, so which, if we were to start building the foundation, probably the most, makes the most amount of sense. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And which one did you say was the one? One of the things that we talked about, some of us protocols. Well, That's which, building the that, foundation. Okay, so yep. yeah, that makes sense. I, I'm up for it. I don't know how everybody else feels, but yeah. Yeah, I think, I think it's a um, great opportunity. And we did something smaller with, um, who was it, Mike? No. It was Mike Gilbert. Probably Mike, Mike Gilbert. Yeah. yeah some years ago and um, Glenn's been here doing um, the executive director did a few things I think I mean for my per my preference I'd like to try to say you know commit to the, the process and for planning purposes and everyone's time be able to sort of map that out and make sure that it's you know workable um, and I don't know I leave every Monday night open myself because you never know when we're gonna have a school committee <laughs> meeting so <laughs> generally you know that might work better for our committee than seven Saturdays. On a Friday morning. Yes, yeah, seven o'clock on Friday. <laughs> <laughs> no, if you want me to pay attention, I can't be getting ready to go to work. <laughs> so um, I, I think it's you know a great opportunity for us. And, and you said make kind of a hiatus hiatus right now, but when does the process start? I mean, is it are we talking about June and maybe working through the summer? Our our budget's done. Yeah. So we're. That piece is done. <laughs> <laughs> You're lucky. Yes. <laughs> I think this, this is, I mean, I, I would rather get some of these in before we actually start our budget process because we go into, yeah. we have a lot of meetings and, and mm -hmm. income meetings and financial <coughs> form. So from, I don't know, October to April is, is sort of a hard road for us. <laughs> So I, I think we can Well, start. and I think you, you've recently had elections. You have some new members of the team. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and that's really often a great time to get started mm -hmm. um, because it really helps the new members <coughs> sort of be on a faster learning curve right. um, of getting um, accustomed to working on the committee and learning all the ins and outs. And again, you know, unlike charting the course where you're there with people from many other communities, it's, it's your own committee. Um, that you're learning about and starting to contribute to us. I did. Um, I'm just, it's, it's um, a slowing period for us because the budget's done, but it's not a slowing period for, it's not a slower period for our administration. And so one of my concerns is the preparation for our meetings. Is it some of the preparation can the school committee members do some of well, that actually preparation? We're hoping that the school committee does most of the preparation mm. so that you know I may call the superintendent and have a conversation about you know where can I get a hold of the documents you know either the superintendent or the chair or both 
you know, can you answer some questions for me about where you are so that I understand, and I'm, again, not retreading ground that's well trod, mm -hmm. um, but there's really minimal work on the part of the superintendent other than, you know, a conversation with me at some point. Chuck, so yes. uh, but we would have definitely Dr. Darty and, and Mr. Martin would be there. And Absolutely. Would, would typically the finance. Whoever um, you want to be there. Okay, so we'd have to. Okay. Dorothy, who's in your work with other school committees? Who's from the administration level? Who's typically there? The superintendent's always there. Okay. Um, and it's really very dependent on the committee mm -hmm. um, whether there's any other um, administrators there or not. I, you know, I've had committees where there's multiple assistant superintendents, the business, you know, the finance director. Um, it's really totally up to the committee who they want to have at the table. Now that that's an, considered an open meeting, or or is it? Okay. They're you, they're posted as open meetings. They're posted as workshops. Um, you would never be in a situation where you would be taking a vote. Right. Um, so it <coughs> it's certainly appropriate to post it as a workshop. I guess you know I have to think about it longer but my initial reaction is probably more of a uh, like a retreat format uh, which mm -hmm. we usually do at least a, probably a couple times a year on it, which we will come in on a Saturday and work from 9 to noon or something and versus because uh, <coughs> there's always something that comes up that needs to be addressed in a regular meeting and I wouldn't want that to Th that to take away time from a workshop that mm -hmm. we had planned. Well, and I always hope it's in a setting where it's a little bit more conducive to conversation and discussion as opposed to a business meeting set up and format. Because um, certainly, I, you know, when I have the workshops, I start out by saying I'm going to talk, and then hopefully by the end, I'm not doing hardly any talking. You guys are doing all the talking. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Is it something that the Reading Teachers Association could observe and learn from also? I, I would, I, yeah, I don't see any problem in that. No. That would be different, but I don't see why not. Uh, it's always it's an open meeting, so. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, try to make it a collaboration. Yeah. Nancy, did you have? No, no, I just wanted to look. So what the next steps is we just get back to you and say we'll, we'll, we'll find a think. date. Okay. Yep. Great. So we Thank can talk about the date. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very Thanks, well. Thanks for yeah, uh, great. coming yeah. to the robotics. Well that was <laughs> 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 you don't have to thank me. That was a lot of fun. I, I enjoyed that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before we jump, I, I, I apologize. Uh, I had Andrea, I apologize. Alex uh, Nazaro, mm -hmm. I said that right, uh, for not introducing you sooner. I, uh, I know you've been sitting here. Welcome. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're uh, sorry to see Andrea. Well, we're happy that she's graduating. <laughs> <laughs> So we sure of that? I, where, where are you, what are you doing next year? Um, I'm heading to Suffolk University Great. in the fall, and I plan to major in communications and a minor in theater. Great. So nice. I'm very excited. Great. Um, I'd just like to say to the committee real quick that I've really enjoyed being a student representative. I, I remember two years ago being so scared at my first meeting. <laughs> Everyone was just really professional, and I've kind of learned throughout the two years that I can be comfortable around all these adults and um, I've gone through kindergarten to being a senior in high school through the Reading Public School System and I'm very thankful for all my experiences here so thank you very much. Thank you for those comments. Uh, you, I mean you know it always is you know in some of your your predecessors you you, you came right in uh, and jumped right in which was great uh, you know you didn't sit there and what weren't a spectator for the two years. I mean, you really participate, and we appreciate that. It's very and interesting, know and you know. The community does, too. Yeah. So.
Thank you. Uh, this is uh, from the committee. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Carl, Carl will be back. Too. Carl will be back. Carl will be back. <laughs> Baseball game is over. He should be here. <laughs> Great. Thank you. And welcome, Al. Uh, Martha, do you want to? Do you want to go into the next She's agenda item. I think this is a shared uh, with uh, Ms. Borowski, um, who was uh. able to attend <coughs> the, um, the audit committee meeting. Yeah, did you want to give yeah. a report on that first, and then Martha can present? Um, certainly. Is that I mean, they're they're combined. Yeah. I'll I'll um yeah I'll report out on the audit committee, and if you have anything to add, just jump right in. Okay, we'll do it that way. Um, so the audit. Uh, this is my second or third um, annual town audit on the audit committee, and we continue to have a phenomenal financial reputation in, um, in the world. Uh, the auditors found no significant deficiencies or material weaknesses, so that means it was a clean and an excellent audit. Um, we're all in compliance with accounting standards. Our financial and internal controls are excellent. Um, a couple areas of discussion were our pension obligation. We are um, funding that and are due to, yep, 2028 is the target to have fully funded pension liability. <laughs> that's it's 2015. That's it's in sight. Um, so we talked about the pension liability. We're um, adequately working towards fully funding that liability. The other big uh, liability, and it should be stated that the pension liability and the OPEB, which I'm about to speak to, are um, big liabilities that all communities are facing. This is not at all something specific to Reading. Basically. Um, the, the accounting standards have changed over the last few years, requiring municipalities to put right at the front that they have these pension obligations that they are going to have to um, take care of. And also OPEB, which stands for Other Post-Employment Benefits, it's predominantly retiree health care. So um, those are the two big um, liabilities that are out there. We're adequately funding them. Um, we're really in great shape with them. So um, that was the update from there. The only other thing that I think specifically um, relates to the schools is there was a note in the management letter, and just to clarify, uh, a note is a, a suggestion that you might want to tighten up financial controls or look at something. So it isn't a criticism, it isn't a suggestion that something was done incorrectly. It's just an area to look at for potential improvement. And they did find one involving our revolving accounts. Um, both on the town and the school side, there are several revolving accounts that have significant balances that have um, money in them that appear to be more than 12 months worth of expenses, which the auditors felt that that shouldn't really be. Um, so they encouraged um, Martha, our director of finance, to work with um, Sharon Angstrom, the town accountant, um, together to look at each revolving account individually. Each one has its own set of regulations. Each one has its own set of guidelines. Each really needs to be looked at separately. on its own separately. Um, and just make sure that expenses are being adequately charged to those accounts, that the fee structure is appropriate, um, and just basically improve the process. Uh, and I know Martha and Sharon have already started those discussions and are moving forward. So yeah. I'll, I'll hand it over to you with that. Can I, just one thing, one, just to elaborate on that, one thing that the, the audit committee does uh, after this meeting, the audit, where the audit is presented is give direction to the auditors to uh, do tests or uh, evaluate certain areas. And last year, I guess at this time, right around this time, the audit committee made the recommendation that we look at uh, revolving accounts and stuff. So that's why they came back with their evaluation of that. Mm -hmm. uh, in the past, they've looked at the school lunch program or the, uh, uh, I'm trying to think, uh, the ambulance billings in the town side, different things like that. So uh, they weren't uh, looking for a smoking gun. That was oh, direction yeah. that we gave them at the time. I, you yep. made me realize, I should probably say this for anyone who doesn't know what the audit committee is. The audit committee is made up of uh, members of the Board of Selectmen. Uh, Mr. Robinson and I are the representatives from the school committee. Finance committee has representation there. Town meeting has representation there. The town accountant goes. So it's really sort of a collaborative group from all areas of local government that meet together to get the audit presented to us. It, it, it just, sorry. No, that's okay. <laughs> it is, uh, not every town has an audit committee. Right. Uh, so it is, uh, it is a good thing that we have that, and 
you know, there's there's some you know there's some very people in. I mean, uh, Steve Herrick uh, is a CPA, I think, and so there's there's well qualified people that good. ask good questions and uh, know know how to read financial statements. No, and and you know I. I do, you know, from speaking with the town accountant, I do know that the audit was fine um, and that this was, you know, part of a management letter, as, as Mrs. Borowski suggested, it's for us to look at and to review. And um, Sharon and I, Ms. Sangstrom and I, work together on the town response, and, um, and we have a plan over the next six months to really actively look at what we just, what she just discussed, look at our fee structure, look at our expenses. Um, we've looked at a number of DOR opinions on, on what we can and can't charge to our revolving funds looking for other areas of, of maybe indirect costs that, that we have not been charging against the revolving funds. So we really are going to do our due diligence to, to look at them and, um, and uh, you know, make appropriate actions as necessary. So um, there were a couple other audits that I just wanted to talk about for a moment. <clears throat> um, we did have our single one audit, which is our, our annual audit of our federal grants. And um, it's not just our grants, it's the town grants as well, so any federal, federal funds that we get. So the ARCASA is part of this audit. Um, uh, the largest grant that we do get that it's federal is our IDEA grant, um, which is about 84% of the money that the school department gets on our federal grants. And we had no findings, which is always nice to have. Um, and we also just had our audit of our end of year report, which um, did have um, four minor findings that we will fix with an amendment. And by minor findings, I mean um, I miscounted the number of students who were on a bus. It's supposed to be, I put 77, it's really 66. I mean, they really are minor, minor findings that we will correct with an amendment to our end of year report. So, um, and uh, I think that's, I think that's it. The other, I mean, there was another minor finding, the, the, and this is something, some of this is new when you learn as you go with the end of year report. Um, the budget that was approved at town meeting last year was amended by the special, either the September town meeting or the November town meeting. I one of the special town meetings. One of the special town meetings. Yeah. So I should have amended schedule 19 because they appropriated more funds for capital. So like, when I say minor findings, I really do mean minor findings. So. Um, so those are the other audits. We do have an audit that we're currently, um, working with uh, Melanson Heath on to get an engagement letter out there. Um, and you'll hear more about this as a committee at MASS and MASC in November. Um, really, they're encouraging all districts to really start to, um, on a periodic basis, uh, audit their student activity accounts. And we have not had an audit of our student activity accounts in... It's been, it's been a while. Yeah, it's, it's probably been six, five or six years. Yeah, at least five or six years. Yeah. Um, that said, um, we do replenish it through the warrant process. The invoices are all looked at by the town accountant. Um, we do have internal controls in place. So the um, DESC just worked with, uh, oh gosh, now I can't think of the name of the group. Uh, it was an outside auditors to come up with um, a new compliance audit for the student activity account. So that's what we're looking at engaging Melanson and Heath to come out and do that over the summer. Um, so you will hear about that at MASC and MASS in November. There's going to be a session on it. Um, so that was it on audits. Love fun to be audited. I was an auditor. <laughs> Mr. Knight. Um, so you mentioned grant, but I didn't, what was, the, what were the findings on the grant? There weren't any. Weren't any? No. Was the good. single one audit had no findings. Okay. And then um, which particular <laughs> revolving accounts were over? The ma ma management letter did not specify any revolving counts in particular. I mean, there's there's a number on the town side and the school side, so really the, it didn't identify any. The the would management letter language was in the memo that I sent out. Would would we know that, or how would we how would you make plans if? Well, we're looking at all of them, okay. so it's not any one in particular. Certainly, um, there are a few that <coughs> have a significant balance that will start on those, but um, it's really it's not any one in particular. Will we get uh, information back on this going forward? Certainly, if we're going to look at uh, changing our fee structure or making any recommendations on expenses, which may uh, impact the FY17 budget, if we determine that we want to draw down more on indirect expenses or make any changes to the FY16 budget, certainly the committee. So when do you think you'll be com you have completed that work with uh, the town account? Um, I'm hoping to get it done over the summer because that's my okay. downtime, but yeah. uh, we'll, we'll see what else comes up. <laughs> okay, good. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? 
Yes. Just a quick addition. I probably should have mentioned this when I reported out. I asked at the audit. I don't. Well, I think I asked. Maybe someone else asked. Um, uh, the auditors offered that this particular management note is something that they have um, done in several communities. Mm -hmm. So this issue of revolving accounts is just an area that's <coughs> receiving some attention right now. And just again to point, it's not a reading specific thing. It's something that they're encouraging many communities to take mm -hmm. a look at. Okay. So. Yeah. Just to, so it's basically this was something that previously the audit committee had sort of um, mentioned as something to be looking at. Did I get that, pre or at least talk to the auditors about? I don't remember that, but I, I would believe that and then, that's true. And then basically it's just something that's sort of an item that's on the radar from the auditor's perspective, and they're just saying this is something you should look into. So it's strictly just these notes. Yes, this but is not a finding. No, it's not a not a finding. It's really it's <laughs> no, okay. as Mrs. Borowski said. It's really a suggestion to look at them, and and um, it's it's really looking at the matching the revenue and expense, matching mm -hmm. the revenue and expense. Okay, so. okay. I just wanted to be clear. I'm also an internal auditor at my company too, so <laughs> different language for the um, report. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Do you <coughs> want to continue with the reports, or do you want me to go into the update on the mm. other one? Update on the other one. Update the other one. Okay. So um, to kind of continue the conversation, um, there is one particular revolving fund, um, the adult education revolving fund, that um, has a deficit at this point in the year that um, when consulting with the town accountant, um, it's appropriate to make a uh, a transfer from our operating budget to uh, correct the deficit at this point. Um, again, it's the adult education. It's it's really primarily a function of um, the purchase of the drivers, of the vehicle. There was a lot of upfront costs and the um, the timing that it took to get classes up and running. So um, it's 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 a matching of revenue and expenses in the opposite direction on this one, unfortunately. So. Um, um, to ask, answer any questions that you may have about this one. Did they actually? The motion? Yeah. Why don't I make the make motion? The motion. Uh, I move to approve the transfer of ten thousand dollars from the administration cost center to the adult education revolving account. Second. Mr. Mayor. So um, I have a little bit of background on the driver's ed program and uh, was the adult ed director for several years. But did they purchase it or did they do a um, a lease uh, lease to buy? They purchased, purchased it outright. It? Mm -hmm. Okay. So was it purchase? Was was there an option to do a? Um, they call it a municipal lease. So you pay it off over three years, and at the end, it's your vehicle. Um, my understanding is that option would have to be <coughs> voted on at town meeting because you'd be taking on debt, and um, we had the money in the fund at the time, and so the decision was made to purchase it outright. Mm -hmm. This was done over a year ago. Mm -hmm. I know. I, I actually sat with them and gave them some in, insight on it. So, <coughs> is what's in a deficit the the driving the student driving portion or the whole adult education? Because I thought we talked about that having us. We this came up at town meeting where we had a. <coughs> am I confusing it with? No, you're thinking of extended day. Okay. That's a whole. That was a whole other conversation that happened. Sorry. Are those two? They're not connected. Extended no. day. Different mass general. I thought laws. they were the same. Oh, okay. Yeah. No. This is uh, the same is, coordinator. The same yes. person is coordinating it. <laughs> yes. Um, different sections of the mass general law set them up. Um, extended day is uh, extended program, and this one is considered community education. So, different laws, different funds. Um, driver's Ed is a subset of the adult education fund. Um, and so it's it's the component that helped tip the scale on the fund, but it's uh, it's we don't report <coughs> on it separately. The, the, delay, the, the deficit right now is caused by the fact that the program was a, had a delayed start. The car pretty much sat dormant while the program was up and running. And so now we have a second cohort going. Yes, I believe so we now have a second cohort going. So now the program is starting to move forward. So, uh, there's no other place that you, we can't take this out of an, uh, another revolving account within the extended day. To, uh, this is not part of the extended adult day. Ed. Well, under the adult ed. Yeah. No, it's it, this is in totality for adult ed. So adult ed is limited to um, driver's ed and then the the course offerings that they have at the at the night uh, in the evening times here at the high school. 
They range from yoga to a men's basketball league to knitting to furniture refinishing. Furniture refinishing. <laughs> so it's um it's it's a variety of of um, uh, low fee, if you will, low cost and low fee. So really, um, this drained the account when we purchased the car outright, um, and so um, with the delay with getting the program started. I guess it just seems to me. I guess well, I'm hearing we can't do it, but. What a, one the part of the discussion I'm hearing that the the auditors are saying we have too much in our revolving accounts, yet we can't use some of it for right. When we have a when we have a deficit like this, it has to be funded through the operating budget. Yeah. Okay. And then yep. just um, I'll, I'll say this that. Um, it was very lucrative um, back in the day. We made a lot of money off of it, and it was um, at a very reasonable cost compared to the private schools, and mm -hmm. it was uh, taught well. We actually had you know, teachers in the school system that are doing it. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I think when I left, we had, you know, we probably would have gotten in trouble with the auditor because we had a substantial amount in the, uh, in the revolving account. That, that said, though, I'm just, I'm just not so sure on the municipal lease. I remember back when we were doing it. The reason they call it a municipal lease, it's not, you're not really taking on debt and it's a lease. I don't know if that, I'm just wondering if there's something to look at going forward. At the time when I left, we were looking at potentially buying, getting another vehicle because we had so many students enrolled in the program. But it will, it will be profitable and it used to actually pay for a lot of the other programming that we did in the evening that, you know, you could run a course with two people in it because the driver's ed program was that, that successful. So mm -hmm. hopefully it gets up there, gets going. Mm -hmm. Yes. Did I understand correctly that you said one of the things that you and the town town accountant are going to do going forward is to look at our revolving accounts and see whether there are other places, other expenses that those res revolving accounts can help pay for that are related to their raison d'etre? So what that means. Uh, sorry, <laughs> the reason that they're established. Yes. Um, so, so for example, this year in the FY16 budget is the first time that we introduced having a facilities charge to extended day. They run their program here in our facilities. That's an indirect cost that we can appropriately charge to that revolving fund. So we are going to look for other areas where there are appropriate indirect expenses that we could charge to some of the revolving funds. And so that might help with this mm -hmm. because we're moving money to there. Oh, that won't help with this. We, we, we can't move money into this fund from any other source other than the operating budget because it's set up. There aren't, we don't have any other funds that are set up under this mass general law. But if we did I, just take oh. money back into the operating budget from some of the revolving accounts, then it's money yes. that could be expended. Yes, that's what yes. I'm yes. trying to say. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, I misunderstood what you were, you were suggesting. It's okay, I'm not yes. financially. I had a question just to clarify. So the person that you hired last year, their salary is coming out of this. Would that have made a difference in terms of what you have left in this fund? Because didn't you uh, put the, the salary of the, facil the event facilitator in adult ed? If that uh, had there's come from someplace else, would that have left this budget not in a deficit? Um, the salary for that person is charged here. It's split here because that person has uh, multiple responsibilities between this and extended day, so that person's salary is... No, I don't think that's what she asked. Okay. You're asking about the facility <laughs> rental coordinator? Yeah. That comes out of facilities. The, facili yeah. the facilities rental revolving account. That's salary. Okay. There was always a portion of that. When we, when we split that off, there was always a portion of this person in this budget. So that can't be put someplace out to, to free up that money? No. Can I just yes. have ideas about this person? Were we just talking about like the person who's in charge of the adult ed? And so I'm like now I'm confused. I'm sorry. There is there is a coordinator that oversees um, extended day adult education. Okay. So that person oversees all these programs. And charged. You also have uh, another person who oversees who who is part of the uh, adult ed driver's ed. And is part uh, oversees the um, extended day as well. 
So salaries are charged to the appropriate revolving accounts. Okay. Don't confuse extended day with adult debt. It's two right, separate two revolving separate accounts. Separate mass general law. I'm got yes. that. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Anyone else? All those in favor of the motion. Six zero. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thanks. Going to uh, reports. No, oh, let's just, uh, Andrea, you have a final report? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, this past week, a lot of concerts happened here at the school. The band concert had their um, end of the year concert Wednesday night, chorus had their spring into song Thursday night. And um, also this past weekend, the, the drama club takes a yearly trip to New York City, and we see two shows, um, and it was it's a very exhausting day. We leave here at like 7 a.m., we come back at 4 in the morning, Sunday, so very tiring, but very fun. And um, besides that, the seizures are finishing up. Um, we have the barbecue as our half day Wednesday, um, which I'm really looking forward to. And um, prom is next week, so very exciting times ahead for the seniors. When's the all night party or whatever they have in the field house? June. It's the following third. week. Yeah, like um, same same as the same night as the cruise. In the field house? Yep. Thank you. Thank you. You're off the hook, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> for tonight, for tonight, right? Did you have a group? I did, thank you. Um, when I wasn't at audit committee meeting last week, I was at the recreation committee meeting. Um, last month, town meeting approved a million dollars, up to a million dollars for field lighting in the Birch Meadow complex. The process has begun, um, the very beginning. They're just beginning to dig holes and, and to begin to think about it, but they have started it. There is um, a tentative hope to have some of the lights installed by September, awesome. we'll see. Um, the second phase of that process is, um, is not funded but they want to the recreation committee and department want to kind of solicit community feedback for what they would like to see once the lights are up what other things do they want to see so there's talk about do we need additional parking would public restrooms in that area be helpful would a pavilion would concessions um so they've they've brainstormed a lot of ideas and there's going to be a survey coming out very 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 soon so be on the lookout and social media and your email for that um and please please take it it's a quick survey it's very easy to do um, and they're basically trying to get as much community feedback as they can to find out what the community wants for the future of the Birch Meadow Complex. We talked about um, the field hockey goals at Parker. There are two um, field hockey goals at Parker that were donated by Girl Scouts last year, and they're allowing a really vibrant field hockey program <coughs> there. One of them, unfortunately, has been damaged, and the Recreation Committee is very hopeful to be able to find the funding to um, replace that uh, at the end of the year. Uh, a subcommittee was formed to look at field rental procedures and fees. Uh, the members of the <coughs> subcommittee are John Halsey, Frank Driscoll, and Dan Foley. So they'll be working on that and reporting back. And the last thing we talked about is the renovations at Killam. So they're going to be redoing all of the fields at Killam. Uh, I did have the opportunity to remind them that we're doing our own work at Killam with modular classrooms. And I know that they're working closely with Martha, but I reiterated <coughs> we, we very well may need those fields up until the last day of school um, <laughs> because we'll have modular construction going on. So they already knew that, and I know they're working with yeah. you. But I was able to just remind them yeah, how important that was. Mm -hmm. That's okay. recreation. Thank you. Any other reports, Tom? Gary? Stop. Um, just a quick reminder that the Human Relations Advisory Committee is going to go before the selectmen tomorrow night. We're um, expected to go on about 9.30, but they want us there about 9.15 to talk about the sunset clause, so we're going to be requesting to be continued as a committee. Um, also, over the last two weeks, I've been to the State House a couple of times. The first time was for the Mass Association of School Committees opportunity it's called the day on the hill mm -hmm. um, and it's an opportunity to talk with our legislators about the budgets and the state house has been very busy lately talking about our budgets the house has passed their version the senate has been working on theirs and the house actually um, representatives brad jones and jim dwyer did a great job for us um, 
supporting more foundation money and more money for MECO, and um, they they allotted money for the with the, the house for a safe and supportive school. So I'm not actually sure of today's update, but um, the Senate um, Jason Lewis has been working really hard to um, promote a bill that will bring back some money for safe and supportive schools as well as bring up the level of Senate funding for MECO. Um, but we're very fortunate to have the support of legislators that are working so hard for our, our districts. Um, and um, a special caveat, when I went, this was my first time going to the Mass Association of School Committees Day on the Hill. And it includes some speakers, some um, updates on the budget. It also includes um, the lobbying, and they encourage students to come with us to do this lobbying. And I was thinking that that would be a very exciting opportunity next year if student our student representatives, sorry, Andrea, would, right there would like to come. The street, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I passed Suffolk on the way. Um, that it would be very exciting because we really get time to sit down with our legislators and learn more about what decisions they're having to make and how we can help them make the best decisions we feel for our districts. So just want to plant that seed. Um, and also for the Metco Lobby Day is another great opportunity to go. Um, I also wanted to say that Friday, last Friday, was the 30th anniversary of celebration of understanding disabilities. It was a very exciting um, celebration and fundraiser. And um, Jason Lewis actually came with a House and Senate approved proclamation honoring the 30 years of service from understanding disabilities. And it just was by quite coincidence that I was with Representative Dwyer in the House chamber when they approved this proclamation. <laughs> so it was very exciting. Um, but thank you. Thank you. And congratulations to UD, Understanding yes. Disabilities. Yes. I'll just add to that that um, also Ms. Borowski was there Friday night and, and myself got some great representation from the school committee. And it was a really very, very nicely done event, I thought. And just to emphasize, you know, how, how important and how much value understanding disabilities brings to our students and our curriculum. And really to recognize that they do that work with, with a, a large cadre of volunteers um, that, that spend time in the classroom with the students delivering the, the various programs. And uh, that's, you know, really important. That program can only operate with um, the support of people in the community and it really I think is making a difference and it, it is amazing that it's you know 30 years and it was it was Judy LeBlanc right who mm -hmm. um, started basing, basically trying to teach kids something about what it's like to be blind and it really um, you know it's, and it's beyond breading as a community even but uh, it was re really nicely done so it was got another down so I did yes. want to mention something actually. So um, this morning I got a, um, a report from a uh, former student, a uh, friend of mine actually now, and um, he indicated, sent me a link to, I, I, was, I had a chance to just sort of look at it quickly, but um, what I saw was the Mass Dep uh, Department of Public Health is um, obviously concerned about the opiate crisis in our state and um, projected some uh, funding for schools for uh, evidence-based curriculum that would address uh, the opiate issues. And our, our, our school, maybe we haven't had any students actually, um, you know, have opiate uh, addictions. Uh, maybe they do have addictions, but we haven't had any deaths. But we've had many, many graduates that are, have died, Some, several students of mine that uh, um, never would have thought it um, back when I had them in elementary school that uh, they would die from uh, a heroin overdose. So there's more to follow on that, and I'll follow up on it. Thank you. Did Dr. Daugherty, did you, or to Craig, did you? I have, I have several things. Okay. Um, I have some information for you. Um, this actually was generated from a question that Nancy had brought up. Okay. 
So I'll answer this question. I'll pass that memo around. A few weeks ago, I know Nancy um, had made a, a request on some some information. So um, this is this is one piece of the information. Um, this breaks down. Um, the teacher retention data for for the last five years. We don't have obviously this year's data yet because the school year hasn't ended. Um, right now, we only keep three categories. Uh, I I know that in the future we are going to be drilling down deeper on this. We've set up now an exit survey interview. Um, our new human resource administrator, Michelle Saunders, is is now has created that, and we'll be sending that out for any staff in the future that will be leaving the, the district. But you can see we have three categories. Um, the first category is the resigned category. Resigned can mean a lot of things, um, and I've, I've listed some of them here. Um, it could mean relocation out of state, job advancement, leaving teaching to raise a family, leaving for another school district. There's, there's a lot of different reasons why a teacher would submit a resignation. We have not categorized those in the pass and we will certainly be doing that from this point forward. Um, the second category I think is pretty self-explanatory and that's retired. Um, so that would be someone that is retiring from teaching. And then the third is called a non-renewal. This is a teacher's contract that's not being renewed and it could be for a variety of reasons. Um, what could be a, a job reduction, which we did have some in the past where um, we had to make some budget cuts. Um, some some reductions in, in staff and force. Um, others also could be just a non-renewal because um, the position no longer exists or for performance reasons. So we do have, again, we've not drilled down in this category and certainly now we're going to be doing that as well. So um, that that is, I think that's the information you were looking for. The other two, I'm sorry. Just teachers, not. This is just teachers. Just yeah, it's just teachers. Um, the other two questions that I know you had asked, uh, one about the um, behavioral health piece. Um, you can see um, Carolyn Wilson's not here. She had a death in the family. So she's been working on that. And I, we, we want to give a thorough answer to your question because I think it's, it's both an education piece of what is behavioral health and what um, what we do versus what we don't do and what we we already um, recommend to, to students so um, at our next meeting we'll plan on giving that one and then in June I'll also plan on giving a presentation on the survey results so that'll be happening as well so John sometimes we uh, particularly during a you know when we're having budget discussions we'll re constitute or, or change a position that would that, that, that could that fall under a non-renewal non category renewal. yes okay. thank you for bringing that up because that that has happened in the past as well uh, just one thing as a follow-up in terms of when um, you're going to do the behavioral health it's just to add to what Gary had mentioned about your grant there's a really interesting study that came out about um, looking at identifying middle schoolers that um, have a high uh, depression scale and linking that to later opiate use. So it's one of the things that is important about looking at our behavioral health, tying into some of the opiate concerns on that level. So. Thank you. I have a couple other. Sure. Um, we, um, we've begun, uh, not digging yet, but we've begun uh, our modular classroom construction uh, piece uh, will be meeting shortly in the next week with the uh, Vanguard, the construction company, uh, coming up with the different, um, each site is going to be unique. Um, so we're, we're going to be working with them and the building principals to make sure that we have safe areas set up, fenced out areas set up, so, and procedures set up so that students can access at least part of the play areas that are that are out in each in each school. I know that it's access to the backfields of Eaton has been brought up, and um, where the digging is going to occur is, is unfortunately going to take up a lot of the pavement. Um, so we're going to have to come up with a way for students to be able to access that area for some of the end of the year events. 
Um, Barrows, the whole blacktop area is going to be affected. So again, getting access to the field is going to um, be something that we're going to be working on. And Killam will be the least affected in terms of where its location is, but it's right next to the plague uh, ground area. Yeah. So that's going to generate a whole other set of challenges that we're going to have to address. Um, you know, the good news is it's for when we get started, it's probably the last three to four weeks of school. So it's not going to be a large chunk of the school year, but a lot of activities are happening at the end of the school year, so we're going to have to um, figure out the best way to to do it in a safe manner. So, so that's going to be happening. Um, we did send out a first communication to parents, making them aware of this, and then each building principal will be sending out separate communications as we get closer. Um, community forums. Uh, been held in two levels of community forums so far. One have been with staff. I've had three so far with staff. I'm going to be meeting with each uh, staff at their buildings. So we've had uh, high school, uh, Coolidge, and Parker. I've met with the, the staff. Um, and then we've had one community forum at, in the evening, and that is at the high school. Uh, we do have one this Thursday night, um, and that's going to be at Barrows. And then we have one for staff Wednesday afternoon, also at Barrows. Um, and as I had mentioned, gathering all the data, um, right now it's more four general questions. Uh, and then next fall, the questions become more specific based on the data that we've gathered um, from this first round. We're also going to send out a online survey um, uh, closer to when the school year is ending for anyone who couldn't make any of these. Um, so we'll have even more data. Nothing like data. I'm oh, sorry? Nothing like data. Nothing like data. <laughs> it's a data world. Um, and then I, I do want to uh, make an announcement for, uh, for the community that does not have access to any of our school, school uh, social media. Um, and this is about the Joshua Eaton principal search that was going on over the last few months. Um, we, um, as you as may or may not know, we, we started out with 34 um, applicants for the position. Um, screening committee interviewed 13 applicants for the position. Um, they turned over uh, some pre-finalists, which um, were interviewed by myself, Mr. Martin, and Mrs. Leonard during April vacation. Um, we then, from that, moved forward some finalists. We had two finalists that became public, um, Ryan Eckhart from Hammond, Indiana, and Jerry Hammond from Brookline Public Schools. Um, Ms. Mrs. Hammond um, with, withdrew um, prior to the open microphone sessions and the site visit to take a position as a principal in the Wakefield Public Schools. And then Ryan Eckhart participated in the um, open microphone sessions and the site visit at Eaton. Um, a week ago, Wednesday, right? I'm trying mm -hmm. to follow my timeline. Sure. Um, shortly after those, um, that site visit and open microphone sessions, um, we did make um, uh, an offer to Mr. Eckhart uh, to become the principal at the Josh Eaton Elementary School. We were certainly impressed with uh, what we saw and his references. Um, Mr. Eckhart spent a few days um, you know, talking to his family, um, taking a look at um, answers to some questions that he had given us about th things regarding uh, relocation, the job, health benefits, all of those things that are perfectly legitimate questions to ask when you're relocating from, you know, out of state to, to Massachusetts. And then unfortunately, when it was all uh, said and done, um, last week, um, Mr. Eckhart called me and and decline the position. Um, it was not for um, any anything dealing with the the challenges that he would be facing as the principal. In fact, he was he was looking forward to that, um, having already had done uh, sim addressed similar challenges in the school he was in. He said it was the most difficult professional decision that he had ever had to make. Um, I think he was looking at. Um, his current school and um, what he has in place in that school and the supports he has in place in that school and uh, decided that um, 
At this time, he couldn't accept uh, the Joshua Eaton position. So um, we then started looking at other options. Um, and I think the important thing to note uh, is that we're at a point now with Joshua Eaton where uh, it's starting to gain a little bit of momentum. Um, the task force has been meeting um, under the leadership of, of Craig and um, Sherry Van Darken. Um, and, you know, s some things are starting to be put in place for the next, the next person to come in. We didn't want that momentum to be lost. And so what we felt was the next best option was to put in place um, a veteran principal who is very familiar with the culture of the school district, very familiar with um, the <coughs> programs that we're currently implementing, um, and some of the challenges that Joshua Eaton is, is facing. And um, so we went, uh, what we have done is we've created a structure for next year, for the 2015-16 school year where um, Eric Sprung will be the principal at Joshua Eaton and we will be hiring an associate principal for the Birch Meadow School uh, where Mr. Sprung will be working with that person um, and helping that person, mentoring that person um, as, as they, they are running the day-to-day -day operations of Birch Meadow. We feel that this is a good solution um, to keeping the, the Eaton School moving forward and making sure that Birch Meadow also continues to move forward. So we will start a new search um, early next uh, year um, around the February time frame. And one of the questions that was asked, because um, I met with the screening committee when we were about to communicate this so to get them up to speed. And you know, one of the questions that was asked by the screening committee members is what would we do different next year? And, the search, we started the search fairly immediate after Mrs. Feeney has submitted her um, resignation, the, so, and the pool was deep. Um, so really the thing that I would probably change is just shifting the timeline a week or two um, so that you know, we, would, we would not lose candidates during the process, which is what happened this time. Um, so, that, that's an update. I know Mr. Sprung has already sent out communication to staff and parents at Eaton and has already sent out communication to his Birch Meadow community and he's set up meetings and will be setting up meetings with staff and with uh, the Eaton community and also with the Birch Meadow community um, over the next week or so to, to have conversations with them. So that's, that's where we're at. I know he's also gonna be part of the task force. Mm -hmm. And he'll physically be at Joshua Eaton full time. Correct. Okay, because it would, could be a little challenging for him trying to go back and forth. So he'll be working very closely though with the associate principal. Yes. Yes. No, I think this is a very interesting, creative um, solution to a very difficult situation. I, I applaud you for coming up with it. I think it's a great idea. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. That's my report. <coughs> We have uh, liaison appointments to make. Does everyone have a copy of it? No. It's in the packet. So, oh, it's in the packet. It is. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. About the fourth page in. It just looks like this. Okay. Yeah. So, with the audit committee, uh, I guess Jean's uh, term is, or it's their three-year terms, correct? Or two two years or three three-year terms? Three-year terms. Uh, so uh, Jean's term is up, and whether you, I, don't, I assume you want to continue. Or? I really like serving on the audit committee, so I'm happy to do it. However, if there's anybody at the table who really has a passion for financial statements, <laughs> <laughs> I do. I, feel I think know. I'm precluded. No <laughs> Certainly, uh, I, I'm happy to continue to do it. Do, I, do we make a motion, <clears throat> or do we do it at the end? Oh, shall I just do it? You may. You may want to just do a whole slate. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. So Jean is saying. And Linda, you said it was three years for the subcommittee. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, the next one is the celebration committee. Can 
Can you talk to that? I don't know. <laughs> we, well, it's we have not been able to get a hold of um, Mr. Blodgett. Um, this was a committee that was formed for the 350th um, celebration of Reading, which I think happened yeah, several years ago. Um, the committee still exists on no. paper, but I don't believe it has been active I'll recently. <laughs> This happened to be one that the Board of Selectmen is looking at. Is this one of the five that yeah. they're sunsetting? It sounds like. Or wanting to sunset? Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. I don't, I don't okay. think so. Okay. And the Board of Selectmen. Who's doing that? We no. don't currently have a liaison. Can I just... Uh, Question: Yes, is are you, would you be required to attend all of the selectmen meetings? I don't. I'm just trying to no. figure out the time commitment. No. I would think it would be for the meetings that there are school-related yeah. issues being discussed. Okay. Or a significant sort of community item, maybe. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, if there's a significant school item, I would most probably go anyway right. regardless of whether you're a liaison or uh. oh, I'm sorry one more question can I volunteer because I only have a year yes <laughs> uh, we have people that are not school committee members that are on the committee so we oh I, I could yeah it doesn't have to just be okay so you could nominate someone else tonight too if you want to be <laughs> <Yeah. on those laughs> <laughs> No, I was just wondering. It seems it seems like the selectmen meeting seems like a big commitment. Is there? Do we ever split that so that if two people were liaisons, then they could figure out between them who can attend when? Is that something we do? I'm not familiar. Yes, go ahead. Um, I would think, and I, I. I would think that for selectman liaison, um, you would go when there were, as it was stated. Um, but you can also just watch movie, uh, watch movies, <laughs> watch movies online. Um, you watch the meetings online on YouTube. Right. So what you can do is see the agenda. You know, you, you don't have to necessarily. I don't believe a school committee member needs to be at every selectman's meeting. For instance, the board of selectmen has a liaison to the school committee, and they come at the beginning of the year and introduce themselves. And I know stay abreast of what we're doing, but I I do not think the expectation is that you attend every meeting at all. Johnson. I think yes. uh, you know maybe during the budget season there's a little bit more interactivity with all the liaison positions but then there's also the financial forum where we're all together anyways but you do see in our meetings you'll <coughs> often see the selectman liaison and like the FinCom liaison at certain points during the budget season I think it sort of works so that that might be a time when you go to a, a more of the meetings and there's also the town sends out the clerk you can sign up for getting all the agendas and so that's really helpful because you get that notice electronically you can look at it you can look at the agenda and like you know decide whether you want to take it in in person or mm -hmm. on YouTube so you know there's a lot of options and if you can't attend and something was important I think like you could call on any member actually mm -hmm. to, to, fill, to potentially fill in I'd, I'd be happy to volunteer for that one Okay. Uh, finance committee I think that kind of falls under the same I mean we go when we need to be there for uh, I, does anyone want to be I'd volunteer for that specifically the liaison What's CPAC? That's the special education. Oh, I'm sorry. Is is that Lisa Gibbs? It it was Lisa Gibbs, but um, I believe that her, it, her term expired. Okay. Is that the group that Caroline yes. just started? Yeah. It's the special education PAC. It's been in place for years. Though. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is anyone interested in that we can 
that's that's actually an area of interest for me. Okay. Same thing. If anybody else wants it, they can certainly have it. But I'm interested in special education, so they happy to do it. They about once a month, I think. If it's too, I I'm also interested. So you if can, you weren't um, you able to go to a meeting, you can have it. You get you get the first name there. There you go. <laughs> the superintendent evaluation if nobody I did it last year where is that on here I don't see that it's is on it the chart in the packet oh it's no. not on our yeah I don't think it's on the motions but it, yeah it, it, it should be it's on the like page four mm -hmm. uh, it's what it's not a motion, not a motion. it should it oh. should be part of it though The uh, facility naming subcommittee. <laughs> <laughs> so I cannot do you, that because I have an outstanding request since October 2015. You could give it back to Chris. Yeah, I think we should. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should ask Chris. I, I'll do that one. <laughs> no, okay, so. Be the gatekeeper for <laughs> Chris. Does that inc doesn't that include the new distinguished educator process as well? Oh. I don't know. I, 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 I believe so. Okay. Yes. So it's facility naming slash distinguished educator. Can I just ask? Are the committee members? There were committee members on that. Are they like still there or? They're still there. Okay, you're on that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> threatening. Yeah. I see that the Human Relations Advisory Committee is not on your list. Okay. But because the person's like already, you're still these oh, okay. are good till 2017. Oh, never these are ones that are either up Neat. for renewal or or we haven't mm -hmm. had anyone on them in a while. Sorry. All right. So, uh, you want to approve? Certainly, Mr. Chair. Move to appoint Jean Borowski as school committee liaison to the audit committee. Move to appoint Everett Blodgett as school committee liaison to the celebration committee. Move to appoint Julie Joyce as school committee liaison to the Board of Selectmen. Move to appoint Gary Nyan as school committee liaison to the Finance Committee. Move to appoint Linda Snow Doxer as school committee liaison to the CPAC. And move to appoint Chuck Robinson to the Facility Naming Subcommittee. Oh, and one more. Move to appoint uh, Elaine Webb to coordinate the superintendent's evaluation. For a second. 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 So I'll be tuning in to the FinCon meetings to make sure you're there. <laughs> <laughs> they're not public. They're not. They're not. Yes, they are. Oh, they are. Oh, yeah. yeah. They are. <laughs> 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 Get it back. <laughs> is this yeah. is the CPAC also CPAC also an open meeting format? Yes, it is. Okay. Yeah. The other discussion. All those in favor of the motion. Six zero. Thanks, everyone, for volunteering. Okay, we have just minutes. I That's guess. That's it. Mm -hmm. All right. We'll move, move to move. approve the open session minutes dated May eleventh, two thousand fifteen. Just at the right time. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Discussion. All those in favor? Six zero. Any other business? Motion to adjourn. Oh, and congratulations again, and welcome, Alex. Move to adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor? Six zero. Thank you.